catalyst to say what has never been said. Just Catalysts to say what has never been said, to see what has never been seen, to draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance, and act what has never before been done, to push the envelope of creativity and language. And what's really important is, I call it the felt presence of direct experience, which is a fancy term which just simply means we have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Don't watch TV. Don't read magazines. Don't even listen to NPR. Create your own road show. The nexus of space and time where you are now is the most immediate sector of your universe. And if you're worrying about Michael Jackson or Bill Clinton or somebody else, then you are disempowered. You're giving it all away to icons. Icons which are maintained by an electronic media so that you want to dress like X or have lips like Y or something. This is shit-brained, this kind of thinking. That is all cultural diversion. And what is real is you and your friends and your associations, your highs, your orgasms, your hopes, your plans, your fears. And we're told, no, we're unimportant, we're peripheral, get a degree, get a job, get a this, get a that, and then you're a player. You don't even want to play in that game. You want to reclaim your mind and get it out of the hands of the cultural engineers who want to turn you into a half-baked moron consuming all this trash that's being manufactured out of the bones of a dying world. Where is that at? gentlemen. You were having a nightmare. What if it's true? Ladies and gentlemen. Alan, it's a possibility, isn't it? The very word secrecy is repugnant. Secrets. In a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers constant extreme danger which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger, extreme danger, that an announced need for increased security. This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Carr. Will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's Control. You're crazy. And no officials, high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes. Isn't the Pentagon suspicious that all the buildings would blow up? Or to withhold from the press and the public. I think you're just looking at things for the first time. The facts they deserve to know. You've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What good's a few minutes more gonna do you now? The facts they deserve to know. They deserve to know. Deserve to know.
Alright, I uh, alright. Okay. Alright. I'm gonna What I'm gonna do one day, I'm just gonna release a whole album. Because this is getting longer and longer, the beginning of the show, but there's interesting things to be said there, you know. Facts they deserve to know. Yeah. Okay, there it is. My fist's up. Right. I'll put stuff in it if I need to use it. Right? You ever do that? You should do that. Oh, yeah. So it's another hot, hot, hot Toronto July kind of Tuesday afternoon. And here we are in this worldy world world <laughs> where I had to play... Um, the music at the beginning of the show that uh, came just after Terrence McKenna's sage word about not letting those who create and dispense the culture tell you exactly how it's going to be. Instead of that, um, think for yourself. You know, uh, understand that there's more work to be done than what is pervade on the media, myself included. If you've heard that I, I've... Um, gotten through a, a rough patch of cancer, perhaps even a fatal one, you might not believe that, and that would be completely where I would hope you would go in the first place to understand uh, that indeed I did have a very debilitating case of you're not going to live any more stage four cancer, and um, I was going to die at the end of 2014. So I was told by the experts, this is Green Crush Conspiracy Queries. Welcome to the show. That's why I talk about these things, because uh, it just it just keeps on being important that there's a means to grow a plant that can turn your life around. Can. It can. It is possible that it will do that. That's my disclaimer, my overt disclaimer for people that uh, seem to be under the misinterpretation that um, I'm telling you that it will always work for everyone all the time. I never said that, and uh, I constantly defend it. <laughs> but it turns out that um, nothing can cure everyone all the time of everything, so I'm not really, you know, out on a limb with that statement. What I'm saying is that it can, as it did with me, uh, through the miracle of apoptosis, hallelujah, apoptosis, it actually helped uh, my cancer cells to kill themselves. And then I went off of it, uh, the oil proper, for a long time through uh, my last major like course of doing what's called FICO, full extraction cannabis oil, or Rick Simpson oil, or what have you. Uh, the last full ingestion of that went from the end of 2016 let, let's say I started in September, actually, I remember that, Start, started September, and I crammed in three courses of doing the oil. You would think that would take seven months if you were following to the letter. Three months for the first course, two months for the second courses each, but I crammed it in there. Once I really uh, started to get up to the threshold level where you're no longer intoxicated or high or wasted or impaired by the cannabis... Uh, simply because you have it in your body, which seems to be the fallacy of those in blue and their, um, <clears throat> their bankers, the judges and, and the cops and everybody in the justice system. Who benefits from this new legalization of cannabis? It will be them. Lots of work coming when there shouldn't have been. But uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of off the point here. I use this cannabis plant... Now, am I endorsing this? I suppose that could be a, a case made, although I could easily argue against it. I'm just stating facts over here. I'm saying that when I got into a pickle medically and they gave me no outs, the first three doors were not an option to me. Chemo, surgery, radiation. Not an option. So please take the heed of that point. You know, I get people telling me, oh, you're telling people to do things they shouldn't be doing. There were no other options. So, because I used my own mind and was open uh, to a, a helpful message, I did so uh, take a look at this cannabis oil aspect. And I know you're, oh, your people are going to get upset and if they don't try it and if they, they don't know that you're telling the truth... You can't know that I'm telling the truth. 
You can't know that. You can want to believe it. And for those that do, you're right. But you don't have to. And that's where you come in. Okay, so when I first got the message that I should try medical cannabis, and that's how vague it was, you should get involved with medical cannabis. That was the message, those, those exact words. You should get involved with medical cannabis. And I got that message uh, at the tail end of a deep, dark year where I was unraveling physically and, uh, and then got a diagnosis of cancer about three hours after that notion of medical cannabis came to me. So when I got the diagnosis a few hours later, all I had in my mind was the notion that I should try medical cannabis and um, a prescription full of morphine so the pain wouldn't hurt me anymore. And then I was able to go back to work in, in, in um, secrecy of my um, hiding my illness, back to my comedy television show. <laughs> so I was able to go back there um, with you know morphine and the knowledge that I needed to get involved with medical cannabis. So how do, how do you even do that? I didn't even know, but it, it did not give me, at that moment, that information and that news. I was bound to follow it up, but it did not give me um, a relaxed feeling. I didn't think, oh, this will be great, no problem then. Um, I was skeptical. First of all, of why would I even think of that at this time? Second of all, really? I'm, I'm so bad now because it's terrible stage four. It's going to kill me soon. And, and what do I know about medical cannabis? Nothing. Oh, I know what I should do. I should turn on the CBC and read Newsweek magazine or some other bullshit. I should read what they have to say on the matter. And then when they get to the point where it's doubtful that it causes any kind of helpful medical improvement whatsoever, I guess I'll just be turning off the TV and throwing my pot away. No. I thought for myself. So today on the music, that's why I wanted to play The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, a theme song from a very funny movie whose theme apparently um, is being recycled. We're not going to spend much time on that at all because um, I didn't really uh, I didn't really care too much for uh, the orchestrations of the entire Trump bl uh, blimp uh, visit. I, I thought it was um, poorly uh, poorly broadcast. The day of it was was well broadcast, but the following day wasn't very well broadcast. And and just a lot of people in the media will tell you things that you'll later find out are not true. Remember when coffee was good for you, and then it was bad for you, and then it was good for you, and then it was bad for you again. Now it's good for you again. Okay, so remember remember when <clears throat> remember when vaccines are 100 safe all the time, but then they do have a vaccine injury compensation board, and you look at the history of why that's there and, and what they did to create it. It can't come from a result of vaccines have always been 100% safe all the time, or they wouldn't have a vaccine injury board. So those are the kinds of things that um, that we've been talking about. Now listen, I've got a great show today. We have a couple of guests in-house, in studio, and I'm very excited about it. We have Ken Proud. He is a former a military guy, Canadian uh, military. And we also have Hannah G., and Henna and uh, and Ken have teamed up to put together a very detailed uh, movie about all of this awareness uh, uh, to which I was speaking of. So they will be coming on shortly, and I've gone long again because I always do because it's only on once a week, and uh, I had some things I needed to say. But um, let's get to uh, some good news. We do have some good news here. Where is it? Where is that good news? Bum, 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 bum. Where the hell is that good news? Oh my goodness. I do believe. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, so what happened there? I lost something here. Oh my goodness. Uh, all right, we'll get back to it, I guess. Where the hell did that thing go? Well, anyway, let's get to uh, the next thing. This is the live show. This is where this is where I got into the studio a little late today and I'm having trouble locating something. Okay, so hang on. Um boy oh boy. It was there yesterday. This program has gone off and left me in the lurch. Again. Oh, wow. What a bummer. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Well, I don't know if it, where, where that thing is. Okay, so... <laughs> anyway, that's the end of the show today. Thanks for coming. Uh, Russ is back. I'm sure he's happy to be here um, after all that trouble. Uh, 
I've got a program that um, is, is kind of freaking out here. Uh, I'm trying to get out of this, but it won't leave me alone. Hang on. Uh, you know what I need is a, I need a tech guy. You know, I need a tech guy. Not, not, not now you. Not now you today. I mean in general in life. <laughs> in general in life, I, I need a tech guy. That's definitely what I need. And um, Okay, so uh, can we just get this damn thing going here? All right. We have a cannabis cocktails, mocktails, and tonics book that I'd like to tell you about. We had a guest on a little bit ago, um, Warren Bobro, and he has sent us a book that we are going to send you. Here it is. Warren Bobro was a fascinating guy on the show a few weeks ago. Episode, I don't know what it was, a few episodes ago. Listen to them all. Don't worry about it too much. This is cannabis, cocktails, mocktails, and tonics. And uh, it's the art of spirited drinks and buzzworthy libations, a collection of 75 recipes. Uh, the, he's also written a book called uh, Apothecary Cocktails. So, yeah, here's, here's, um, what, here's an example here. Uh, uh, so, so, like, he, he's got all kinds of cool drinks. Now, the deal with these is that there's no booze in them, okay? So here's the, here's the Thai Spice Ginger Beer. Oh, that looks good. Thai Spice Ginger Beer. Uh, so what do we have? Is it a lemon zest uh, bottle of uh, non-alcoholic ginger beer? Difference between that and ale. Uh, root tea liquor. Oh, I guess that is a booze in it. What am I saying? <laughs> uh, spearmint tea, etc., etc. Look at that delicious thing. I wish I had one of those right now. And uh, anyway, so we are going to give this book away to one of our fantastic listeners and... We're going to call it a Green Crush giveaway because we're giving it away, and this is Green Crush. Uh, the past guest, Warren. Yeah, I've already said that. Okay, so <laughs> get on our socials at Green Crush Pod. That's at Green Crush Pod for details on how you can be the proud owner of this book. Okay, there it is one more time. Fantastic. All right, so now uh, uh, I, have, um, um, I have a little... Something else we got to get to here is, uh, that's way in the background supposed to be. That's okay. Double load, today. Double load today, right? So here it is. The Canadian government says that their notice of intent to amend cannabis, to amend it. Uh, this is a new thing of their uh, new act. Now, check this out. This just came out last week. Uh, the purpose of this notice of intent to amend is to announce that Health Canada will add phytocannabinoids to the human and veterinary prescription drug lists. Check that shit out. I mean, I guess I gotta say I'm kind of happy to hear that, right? Because if you're not catching why I'd be happy to hear that, I'll tell you. A major world government who used to shit all over the fence, who's been hiding this stuff for a long time, and just keeping a sort of an obscure medical system together, and they've been bucking at people wanting to take it recreationally, are now saying they're adding phytocannabinoids, which means, you know, cannabis, stuff that grows in the sun. And it's going to be for pets. My little pet, he knows what that's like. He's had that by accident one Christmas. Dear Herb, this is to uh, theleafnews.com. Can I smoke my medical marijuana in public? Canada's legal medical cannabis program is a matter of federal law, but Ottawa doesn't regulate smoking in most places. Unfortunately, there's no definitive definitive answer to that question because a bunch of idiots made the laws. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to assume you're a medical cannabis user who's legally registered with Health Canada. Canada. Uh, so then it goes on to explain the very uh, different, depending on the province, depending on all kinds of things. How about Manitoba's Cannabis Harm Prevention Act that amends the province's Non-Smokers Health Protection Act to restrict cannabis smoke just like tobacco smoke without any special exception for medical cannabis users. This is how messed up in the head these people have made themselves. Let's get down to the numbers while we're at it. High costs discourage medical marijuana coverage in Canada despite legalization. So it's going to be expensive even when they get it through. But thank goodness they're getting it through because it's not going to be that expensive because you're not going to be giving out all these other drugs, dummy. You know what I mean? You're you're going to be spending far less money on all kinds of other medical reasons. Stop being on the one and say, well, it's going to be expensive with the cops. Well, then fund it into, uh, uh, you know, habit-forming addiction programs. Put it into there then. 
help people. Look at the Portuguese model. High costs are discouraging insurance companies to give medical marijuana coverage despite the legalization. High costs to reimburse or give coverage uh, needs to be explained to the veteran as the Veterans Affairs Canada's change of hearts too. So we'll have our guests uh, to talk about that on there. Meanwhile, Ontario, this guy Doug Ford, who's just shown up to be some kind of leader, uh, he says that Ontario injured workers are shut out of medical pot coverage. And these folks have been told instead to take opioids. It's the fucking government here saying this shit. Many injured workers in Ontario are being given an ultimatum. Take potentially addictive cocktails of opioids and other pharma or pay for your own weed or help. That's what a CBC Toronto investigation revealed. Meanwhile, there's an, epi- an opioid epidemic. And, um, you know, these people are in pain. And then you get these other wedge holders, these folks that say, well, it's against the law, you know. And uh, I think I'll bring in our guests. I just wanted to play a little something before I do that. So why don't we send the guests on in here? Listen to this thing. Um, Let's go back to Penny Daflos at the Peace Arch border crossing. Penny, what type of cannabis investments can cause problems crossing the border? Well, we're told that Homeland Security was really vague about that, but it could be something as simple as investing in an American marijuana company to keep you from entering the United States. Bud is big business and plenty of people are already profiting, but a new policy at the border could have those seeing green hitting the brakes. I was truly shocked by what happened to me. Sam Zneimer is one of Canada's best-known venture capitalists, recently putting his money behind budding pot companies. He was stopped at the border in May and says it was his investments in weed rather than whether he smoked it that were the issue. In the course of four hours, they never did ask that. And uh, I believe that was because they want to send a message to Canadians that it has not only to do with your personal behavior, but whether in any way uh, you have uh, invested in these companies. Some people are caught off guard. They think it's legal in Washington state, which it is. It's going to be legal in Canada. So what's the big deal? Why not admit to the officer at the border that you've invested in a cannabis company in California? But Len Saunders is seeing a growing number of business people denied entry and even banned from going back for investing in U.S. companies. He says their options are limited. Either stop traveling to the U.S. or get out of the business. Either stop traveling to the U.S. or get out of the business because you decided as a Canadian to invest in either a Canadian company or an American company. And now, uh, because there are so many states that have legal access to cannabis, etc., now you can't even cross the border. Um, they're going to get you into a position where you're, you you're, know, you won't be able to cross. It's illegal. So thankfully, we will have uh, <clears throat> some kind of change here later on. We will talk about it with our guests who have just joined us. Welcome into the room. Here we have Ken Proud is here. Hannah G, nice to see you again. Um, and uh, here we are with, uh, tell us about your, uh, tell us, about, I was going to jump right into the documentary, but <laughs> tell us exactly what you're doing first and uh, and uh, how we came to know you. Of course, Ken is a veteran or he was a vet. I guess if you He's were a veteran, veteran, you're always a veteran, right? Yeah because of the nature of the work and uh and hannah is um i don't know something's happening <laughs> hannah hannah is a documentarian at this point <laughs> so we'll we'll just let you guys describe what you are instead of me spending time with it so thank you so much alan for oh, having us here today shoot um i'm gonna need some help russ and not with a drink i don't know why can you lean right in on that like yeah. like it's yeah that's it just put your okay. mouth right up to it it's okay because okay, this is now? yeah that's better there we go okay thank you for having me today oh you're welcome thanks for being had nobody's ever called me that before what's that what you just called a me. documentarian yeah well, i like it isn't that what you're doing i'm gonna own it now you're so quiet <laughs> you're quiet just you know it, it's okay if you actually touch this thing okay. with your with your lips it's okay they'll clean the gloss off of the foam later on it's no big deal it's mom voice yeah. So, yeah, I want to hear what you have to say. So, um, you know, we came across you guys because, uh, you know, we are affiliated and understand as as for a person who's not ever been in the military. I understand the military relationship um, very well from previous guests and research about cannabis and, and veterans. And uh, I think people get the idea that, uh, you know, you guys are good law uh, abiding folks who are upstanding. You wouldn't be smoking pot, would you? And there's that whole... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's the that's one of the reasons uh, behind the uh, the documentary that we're going to be shooting itself is um, to help educate veterans that have never been around cannabis their entire life and in order to in use right it properly. Away. Yeah, Ken, I'm going to jump in right away. Yeah, go ahead. Because, and forgive me for that, um, the premise of us now, the Veterans Channel, um, producing and airing a medical cannabis veterans docuseries, I'll say, is really uh, about witnessing and capturing veterans in fellowship and in dialogue with one another where they are discussing and addressing the issues that face them, their successes, their challenges um, with not just the right strains of medical cannabis, but the how-to of medical cannabis and the, the, sh the shifts in the laws and how that affects them. My interest in doing that, Alan, is veterans will educate other veterans. Veterans will uplift one another. Veterans United, we believe, will bridge gaps and provide new infrastructures and solutions. So the Veterans Channel's position in producing a medical cannabis docuseries is that veterans will educate one another and start to present various solutions to their issues around medical cannabis. Okay, let's, real quick, what's, for example, anything at all, just tell me what issue, what kind of issue would you be talking about? Because remember, uh, we've spent time together, but a lot of people who have not been in the military or they had a different experience, I mean, uh, what do you mean by an issue? Yeah. Give, me, give me an issue where this would be important. Sure, and it would only be fair for me to pass the baton now to Ken because he has first-hand knowledge and experience. So okay. I would let him share sure. as to what those Fantastic. issues may look like. So one of, the, one of the main starting issues that comes with someone who's never used cannabis before is establishing a dosage level. Because a lot of people don't want to smoke it. They want to eat it. They want to uh, use edible oils. They want to put it into whatever and be able to consume it and medicate that way. So, um, but everybody's edible tolerance is different. And um, there's really no happy medium right off the get-go. You know what I mean? Either you're not going to feel it or you might accidentally take too much. And that's when some people get scared. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then they, they don't want to do any more. And exactly. then they write it off and they, they cut themselves off from a potential. Or the wrong strain. It, right. It, you know, uh, doesn't a interact correctly with their individual endocannabinoid system. And instead mm -hmm. of removing anxiety may cause paranoia may cause anxiety you know what i mean and just it could send them in the wrong direction you know what i mean right. so they need guidance of people who have used multiple strains and um have been in within the cannabis world itself for you know a, a varying degree of time enough to be able to pass on that knowledge to each other so that everybody gains the same level of knowledge and then everybody finds their their end game with cannabis where they're whether it's ptsd and they're trying to get rid of their nightmares or it's chronic pain and they just want to be able to uh walk up a flight of stairs without uh reaching a nine out of ten on a pain scale you know what i mean yeah or, uh, i do <laughs> yeah yeah so how did you get involved you weren't in the military henna so no, what, what, how did you get involved in oh don't call me <laughs> I have to. I, Mark Wicks right. is listening. <laughs> okay. How um, did you get involved? You're not in the You weren't no, in the military. No. Uh, my story, and I'm sticking to it, is I fell in love with one, and then all of them, um, based on um, a military guy. Yes. Okay. So, uh, my partner in in co-creating veteran retreats and our 501c3 veteran retreats foundation, and now what's led to the channel. Um, is a man who served 18 years in the U.S. Army and, and then re resigned. Just before he resigned, tell everybody yes. who's not American what a 501c3 a, is. A, a nonprofit charity. A nonprofit yes. charity, okay. And so I, I witnessed um, his transition and, and in sometimes lack of transition from the military into the civilian world and th uh, in, in looking for and seeking solution and modalities that would assist in his own post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I was then exposed to veterans on, on a grand scale and everything they stand for, what they're suffering from, and I witnessed that when veterans are helping veterans, they're better. Um, veterans who are suffering, if they have another brother that they can help, then they're doing better. And I witnessed that when they are repurposed 
because they live with purpose daily when they're serving, when they're now serving the civilian world again in a different capacity, when you repurpose them, then they do better. They heal physically, emotionally. So once I witnessed veterans helping veterans, then I grew a lane where I would was able to and am able to support and forgive me for saying this to you men, but from a more of a womb perspective, to just present uh, a distribution platform for veterans' voices and right. to present themselves. And, to, and I, so I want to edify them. Okay. Okay, great. And so you are, to do that, you, uh, let's, tell, let's tell everybody first what you came up with. And now, uh, Reese, I'll go backwards. Mm -hmm. You were just uh, where, where I've been living and uh, came into the backyard there and we shot some documentary footage for you. I hope any of that came out. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it's fabulous, actually, yes. And so you, you're going to put some of that or edit it down uh, along with all these other things you're shooting into, a, into a programming and yes. uh, perhaps uh, a complete documentary on its own. Are you doing several different shows or what's... Yes, we are. We're doing a series of shows. Uh, and on today's date, we are highlighting Canada and the U.S. We, we have a what what we call a, a Charlie Charlie one out there looking for in the U.K. for veterans that would be able to share with us, teach us on this side, us Canadians and and Americans, um, what the climate is like for them from their own words. So yes, we'll do a series and we'll highlight not only their um, I won't call them um, testimonials. I'll call them testimonies. Um, their first-hand knowledge is what I what I what I want to capture right. and share through a series of episodes, um, as well as um, different processes that may be educational, different professors and and doctors, um, academics that can speak on the ever-changing world of medical cannabis for us from an R and D perspective as well as an awareness perspective. And so. Before you started shooting this documentary that that you put put me in for some reason, now you you uh, you already had a, a a lot of programming available, and it comes out online, right? And so, where can folks see all of these yes. things? The Veterans Channel can be um, watched and viewed at www.veteranstelevision.com. That's our URL. You can see our shows there. We are we welcome and invite um, veterans, uh, active duty as well all over the world and their dependents to share their stories with us. Contact us. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, con contact us. Share your stories. So you <laughs> you have a lot of, um, I was just pulling something else that, that I'm going to ask you about here. Uh, so you have a lot of people so far behind you. And, of course, how did you meet Ken here? Or you, Ken maybe Thank wants to tell asking. that story. How did you? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. you want to do that. He's actually in the okay. military. How did this come together and say your husband's not involved, but Ken is? How, sure. What's going on? I was invited to, well, the Veterans Channel was invited to, to come and film Vets Canada, uh, a, a gorgeous organization, doing a sweep and, and an awareness campaign in Ottawa looking for homeless veterans. And I met Ken there. He approached me and he shared with me um, uh, in a very brief moment, uh, baking with cannabis. And I said, oh, great, yeah. I need a cooking show. Yeah. Gave him my card. <laughs> and... and um, a week and a half ago, I guess two weeks ago, I contacted Ken and I said, I'm ready now. Um, I'm hearing dialogue uh, in multiple countries about medical cannabis. Yeah. Um, it's time for us to at least highlight what some of those dialogues are. You know, just before bringing you back in, Ken, it's fascinating to me that with the whole thing about PTSD, which I've read a lot about, I figure I've had some, and um, <clears throat> there's different levels of it, and it's induced mm -hmm. by different things. And we always go to the hard level. Of, of PTSD, that's what you want to get rid of. It's trauma, right? Yeah. But there's also a lower key uh, uh, stress that we all uh, go through, humans, circadian rhythm-wise, etc. Uh, it's not as uh, you know difficult as, or depressing, but it still affects. And that is, and, and you're going to get that in the military or or if you're on a sports team or whatever it is, is that human beings apparently um, uh, like to have routine in general. So, you know, you get up at 8 o'clock, you, you know, you brush your teeth or whatever it is and have coffee and toast, whatever you do. Everybody has their own sort of routine that you don't adhere to that locked in every step of the way all the time. But basically, it's a routine. And people do like this. And it's like, oh, you know, it's Sunday now. I want to put my feet up and relax. Everybody has their routines. And this causes a stress when you can't do that routine anymore. 
not because it's up to you, but because, you know, for some reason you can't do it. You know, like sometimes people be on holidays and they go, oh, I just can't wait to get back and <laughs> get home, get back to normal. Because that's the routine. That's still a stressor. That's still generating cortisol at a lower level. So you've always got this surf level of stress and tensions coming in because you're in the military, you're going through all that routine, you've, you've come to adjust to it at a certain point, but now you're out and you have to deal with the difference of it. Same with prisoners, you know, as horrible as it is in there, they're, a lot of them used to this routine and you have to eliminate the stress of that. On top of the fact, the reason you're out is that maybe you're injured such as Ken and, right. and you're dealing with that for the rest of your life. So this is why it's so uh, important, important for so many people on, on so many levels to understand, like, th th you know, that's what the show, we're trying to blow the doors open on, uh, just sit around and get stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much uh, other depth of, of application here. So, so Ken, you guys were uh, working together. You've been doing this for some time now because uh, I wasn't your first shoot. So, no, well, I uh, I've uh, met with uh, five veterans so far, mm -hmm. um, and talked about their stories and how cannabis has affected them. And uh, a couple of them, where it was uh, one, he had to hide it from her while she was still serving, while he was treating his PTSD with cannabis, and his then wife. she used it. Yeah, and then she ended up now she's a cannabis patient, and she used it for her breast cancer that she had. You know, and uh, she how, came how down and, and brought it? us a peace pipe at 420 while we were doing our interview. It was uh, <laughs> it was great. So it was a, uh, it's an amazing transformation for a couple to go through that together. You wow. know what I mean? And how uh, long was he hiding it from her? He w he's been a cannabis patient for six years, and it was about two years, I think, if I remember correctly, where he more or less hit it, and then she retired yeah. and got cancer, and then she decided to. Uh, steer towards cannabis wow. as medication and now they bake with it they make some amazing for things for two with years it. he's hiding it from his wife yeah, I'm just going to check the eaves trough again honey I'll be right back <laughs> come back in <laughs> must, yeah the trough's it's fine really bright out you know <laughs> and again breaking down the stigma and also more yeah. education would prevent scenarios like that from happening in the future yeah it is we do joke about it but it is something that goes on it is incredible to me that that there you go you have a stricture of the military so her uh, uh official legal capacity means that she would have to i guess arrest her husband well point. it's against the military ethos yeah it's right not like it hasn't happened before no exactly but that's where that's where uh, they were at had a few laughs so the military ethos i was kind of touching on that at the beginning the military ethos uh, as i take it in from memory and through going through my life and understanding it from a citizen point of view um, and and movies and books and folks that you've met cannabis smoking is not something that most people associate with uh, with soldiers am I right no ever no like you you could I mean like there's fact, some Vietnam era videos sure. of guys smoking it over in Vietnam but yeah other than that it's not associated with military but they were whatsoever. the freaks on the bubble those guys apparently well, like to the story anyway, yeah right so I mean other than that it's not associated with military whatsoever until now that we're starting to see it be used as a medicine for PTSD especially which is a very um, it's a condition that a lot of people in the military suffer with. Sure. You know what I mean? It's if you've uh, seen the anything. percentage yeah. of civilians with PTSD over military with PTSD is yeah. the, the difference is astonishing, right? So, and then when you start to see results from cannabis, where uh, like I had a military police officer who had uh, nightmares for 25 years of his life. He smoked a joint the first time with some friends that he trusted, and he slept for eight hours with no nightmares. First time in two and a half decades. You know, and wow. so imagine that feeling, that moment of him waking up the next morning. I couldn't even. Yeah, he's on the phone that. looking two for and more weed years, for tonight. Two and a half decades, sorry, and revelation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that would be traumatic in itself. I would imagine if I had a twenty-five year really son of a bitch problem and it just got cured like that with one little thing, and then I realize all the time I put into trauma. There's some. My God, there. you you you've got to feel resentment. It's like. Now, I feel the same resentment when what happened to me medically reversed and I got so much better after being told there was no way to do this with this particular plant substance. Yeah, I got to check my fury sometimes. I really do. It doesn't really go away and it's not going to until the changes are enough have been made to reflect that. But I'll still hate the whole time that, you know, uh, people have been told there's nothing you can do. And this has been fiction for so many of these individual cases from PTSD on to terminal diseases and pain levels I'm going to be paying attention to how this will affect the active duty men and women that are currently serving based on 
the, Good question. the history and the ethos, as you put it. Yeah. So what is the ethos? And let's talk about how we are going to change it. And then when we do that, our military folks going to be, you know, running a point through Raqqa or something and uh, having a toke? Or how does it work? Well, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, done like much looking into what the military ethos are going to stand once legalization federally comes about. They must have a uh, policy, right? But I have seen some news articles that talk about it and how they're going to be uh, conducting limitations and uh, testing and that kind of stuff when it comes to like nanograms and and that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, so it's kind of they're kind of in the like that we don't know how we're going to have it play out exactly stage right now because they're still kind of waiting you know and we can't speak on so their we behalf. can't speak on their behalf either so i mean we can only s- no. i can only go off of what like you know sure. the news p- posts and what comes up on facebook through the various veteran channels and that kind of stuff so you have I, seen uh, some kind of uh, there is some uh, stuff brass right there, ring yeah. assessing the basically the 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 military equivalent of what bill blair is doing Basically, they're talking about it is what I've yeah. seen, more or less. It's in discussion about how to add it in along with the uh, like the alcohol. Uh, right. Because go back to the ethos. So forget about all the weed. What is the military ethos? What What it's is that? Basically, the huge set of rules that tell you uh, how you should conduct yourself as a member of the uh, armed forces, uh, representative of your country, essentially. And right? does it so specifically ban cannabis or does it just not mention it? It bans illicit drugs. And ah. since it's still not federally legal, it's still considered an illicit drug, okay. right? So it's under the same respect as cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine. It's all an illicit drug, right? So anything that's illegal right now is against the illicit drug. And there's no one within the uh, upper echelons of the military to speak to the incongruous nature of what we all know to be alcoholic enjoyment from uh, from the brass on down to, to the lowest private? I believe that's coming down the pipeline. I would... If I had to speculate, I would say that that's on its way. What's on its way? Somebody from higher up in our government that would speak on that. To say, you know, we, we, we've been pounding back alcohol, I mean, like crazy forever. I mean, you've heard of the, there's even a phrase called a drunken sailor. I know that's different. Mm-hmm. It's still a military well, application. Well, it was only but a decade ago, I think, that they removed rum rations from the Navy. There you go. So... This is a th- these are the incongruous sort of uh, um, policy based realities that need redress. And you know, it takes time. You, you you can't have already set systems up like that. And I mean, within the military and in society, you can't set up systems where everything's so punitive and, and you know um, restricted and, and full of danger on the one hand, and then just instantly flip a switch and go, yeah, no, that other stuff is okay, though, that does does that same thing. Or, or worse, it does different things to the brain. So there, there's certainly um, a hypocrisy. So what I'm saying is, once you've made a pile of garbage laws, I'm not ready to trust your new laws when you won't even admit the hypocrisy of the old laws. These are just as messed up, these laws. They're going to be constantly changing them. It's going to be tough to navigate once legalization happens with all the laws. It's going to take time for each individual province and territory to adapt to their own system of the provincial laws that are being set forth. So it's just a matter of time before it all gets hashed out, I think. And yet it's going to be trial and error more than likely yeah. in the beginning because um, they, they don't know enough about cannabis um, in itself. There's not enough research being done. That's the... that's. Why do they tell us it's unhealthy then? Where does, where does that information come from? I think there is research, research being done than most people think. That they're talking about. I think they're mm-hmm. doing research and getting great answers that much would research. lead to yes. <laughs> legal, you know, proliferation. And that's why they don't want the cat out of the bag, mm-hmm. I think, you know. so. And, and I think veterans play a big part in that research and development if we embrace that. Sure. Because um, the firsthand knowledge that I have is veterans sharing their stories on how it has transformed their lives or their spouses um, admitting that okay now he's able to go to the grocery store and shop with us and he's back to being dad and he's he's more involved so I listen to those things and I stay focused on those on the positive while while you men dialogue (laughs) on you know what what could be better I say okay no you're absolutely right we do have men taking their lives and we did have more than one veteran, and you know, forgive me for saying this on the air, but it's true, take their own lives in Canada when the, um, the grams were dropped down 
the, so, the gram? Yes. Or, or the distribution amount that a, a soldier Correct. was allowed to have? Last year in May. Well, what, what was the number before? It was 10 grams. Veterans Affairs would cover up to 10 grams a day. Um, 10 grams just a, a standard day. prescription, right? Right. Uh, from a family doctor. And then and now, after May 22nd of last year, they changed it from 10 to 3. And after, But to get anything over 3, now you need uh, specialist permission. Now, when it comes to the specialist permission, there's a certain set of credentials that they have to have in order to be able to give you the exemption letter. So uh-huh. it's called an exceptional circumstances letter. Wow. And um, so when you get that, now if you have um, pain and a mental health issue, you have to have a specialist from a mental health specialist, a, a specialist letter from a mental health doctor and a pain doctor. Right, you can't have one or the other. You have to have two letters in order to get more than three grams, and that's where a lot of guys are having issues: is finding specialists that will prescribe medical well, cannabis the, or give you the letter. The detractors would say, "Well, if you can't get a doctor to assess that, then maybe you don't need more than three grams a day." I'm sure they hear that all the time. Well, of course. Um, the thing with that is, there's just not the number of doctors that are willing to prescribe medical cannabis in Canada versus the number of doctors willing to prescribe pharmaceutical medications in Canada. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right? And then try to find specialists that are on board with cannabis as medication. That's even more difficult because it takes forever to get into a specialist anyway in Canada, whether it be orthopedic surgeon or pain. I'm currently on a waiting list for a pain specialist and have been for over a year. Wow. See, I was just saying this before you came in, so I won't, I won't be labor because the listeners have already heard it, but in Ontario... And this isn't military, this is just workers. Uh, Injured workers shut out of medical pot coverage, okay, have been told to take opioids instead. Many injured in Ontario are given the ultimatum, take these potentially addictive opioid cocktails and other pharma, or pay for your own help. In other words, it's not going to get covered, Mm -hmm. you know, at this point. You know, we'll we'll see where, uh, we'll see, we'll see where Doug takes us, but... (laughs) Don't know where that's going to go. Um, so when you're, uh, we could talk politics all day, but when you're when you're dealing with people, um, and I'm going to say, you know, veterans, military folks, or maybe even their spouses, when you get right into them mm-hmm. uh, and you're you're spending time with them, don't you just find a re- you you talk about dealing with the positive? Okay, so here's the positive I always find. There's always someone. Um, every week I'll meet at least one person like this, and and maybe more than that, where. Um, they were completely dead set against it, cannabis, okay, for health reasons, probably terrible for you, um, social reasons, their friends don't do it and they think they're a bit of a scumbag if they found out. And the government says things about it that are bad, even though, as you say, there's not enough research. Isn't that amazing where there's not enough research and we know it's dangerous? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really work. But uh, the, the amazing thing to me is that these people don't seem to understand that this stuff is available to everybody all the time in, in certain amounts that are, they're never going to be able to stop. But when they lay down all these facts, um, uh, not these facts, these these edicts, the government, the police, the military isn't in the ethos, etc. And then they have a medical emergency, let's call it, where they get the other side of the story. And, and again, they're just in shell shock almost. That's a PTSD almost like, God, this stuff really does work. I was so wrong about how I was looking at it and and then they're just thrilled because then dad can go and join the picnic and all that stuff you know so more people have to know this and and um, I always get a buzz when someone when I see someone learn that for the first time you know you ever get that yeah I like I like teaching people like that? The, the first time you know what I mean I like yeah. introducing people to it especially when they're brand new and you know I like being the person to teach them you know, to try to yeah. st- get a dosage right so that they don't have to smoke it because that's the big, that's one of the big concerns that a lot of people have is the smoking sure. of it, right? And edible dose can be very difficult to, to nail down without having gone too far into it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or not enough and then you're not satisfied or you're not getting the relief that you need. So but that's all education too. Yeah. I mean, I can grind, I can select my own beans grind them, run them through a little system, make myself a cup of coffee, it's easy. I mean, there's nine steps or whatever. Common Alan, knowledge. But it's easy. There's a generation. Oops, uh, kind of lost you there. Go ahead. There's a generation, Alan, of uh, servicemen and women out there, World War One, World War Two veterans who could probably embrace it in a cup of coffee if they knew how to do that. Sure. 
Yeah, exactly. Put the weed in the coffee. I was just using that as a <laughs> metaphor, but yeah, you're right on about that. Yeah, yeah it's very easy to do. So, um, so now you uh, are going across the country. What, what are some of the places you're going to and, and uh, trying to get together, like some of the other folks that are going to be in here? And what messages have you been hearing that you're going to bring forth in these uh, documented videos? Sure. Um, as Ken shared, he you know touched down on a couple of Canadian veteran families over the last two weeks. Um, we are on our way on Friday to Colorado Springs. We uh, we are there in fellowship. Okay, we are in a, a an outdoor setting. If we're lucky, we're allowed to light the campfire. I found out you know there may be a ban, but oh, we'll see where we are. Yeah. But either way. Um, we have uh, approximately a dozen good men coming together from different walks of life, and some of them have extraordinary stories, and some of them are, are lecturers, and one's writing a book, and um, they're, they are heroes, and they're coming together for us in a, in a setting where we can witness them dialoguing amongst each other so that I can learn for us, so that the channel can learn, and then we will... Uh, we'll get a little B-roll if we're lucky, you know, with the sun going down, I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, so that's our first stop. Not by design, but we are fortunate enough to be in Colorado Springs on, on another matter, film matter. And so it gives us the opportunity to at least touch our veteran family in Colorado and say, hey, what's up with you guys? And, and they know you're coming? Oh, yes. Who? When you say they, who are you referring to? <laughs> your friends. Your friends our friends, Colorado, our yeah. friends know we're coming, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so that's really a, 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 another big problem I find is this inconsistency of the legalities. I mean, the plant itself, pretty much, I haven't been to Antarctica, I haven't been to the Arctic, but it's pretty much everywhere. And in that way, it's uniform and ubiquitous. The laws, however, vary from state to province to, to country to other countries. Apparently, uh, Russia's mad at us. Because uh, Canada mm -hmm. making forth any kind, they must help also mad at Uruguay. I guess I don't know. Um, well, they were mad because Canada's a G seven country. I don't think Uruguay is a G seven. No, country. they're not. But that's a country. But but we're in that. That's the grouping that the G seven countries aren't allowed to have. Well, weed. no, I just read the article and it was uh, it was part of because Russia is part of the G seven. That's why they were mad because it goes against something to do with the G seven treaty. I think it was. I'm not 100 percent exact sure, but it was the G seven, and that's why Russia is mad because he says it breaches international law when we legalize cannabis federally. Yeah, he he's worried about us breaching <coughs> international law. Is he Putin? Okay, just checking. Uh, I wanted to take a minute to read something here because this goes back into. Um, the reason that all, all those different jurisdictions, it's because of how we police and, and what, we, <clears throat> what we do in, uh, as far as locking people up for using it or what have you. So uh, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, what would I like to do? I'd like to play this little piece here. It is, <clears throat> this is an article that I would like to read, and I wanted to uh, save a couple articles to read. I usually read a bunch before the guest comes in, but I wanted your feedback on these because you're, you're plugged into two worlds, right? I mean, you're, you're a citizen, but you're also a veteran, right? So you're mm -hmm. both, and, and you guys know what's going on. So listen to this. Policing costs climbing too steeply, police services boards say. In Toronto, <clears throat> Ontario's police forces are calling on the governing liberals, so this is an older article, uh, to halt rising policing costs, which are climbing at a rate of two, or sorry, five to seven percent a year. The uh, province should consider centralizing police bargaining for municipalities and find ways to eliminate the use of police officers for non-core tasks, said the president of the Ontario Association <clears throat> of Police Services Boards. That may include using more civilians or giving up some tasks to private security firms, he said. We need to sit down and do that kind of an analysis and get away from the notion that every service provided by police must be performed by a uniformed officer. The police, the province should also cap wage and increases at the rate of inflation, blah, 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 some other stuff there. But he's basically saying that um, policing is going up 5 to 7% a year, and it's getting out of control. And it was really expensive. It was a, a fucking burden, okay? Because this is in 2012. This article was 2012. It's six years old. So can I say that policing has gone up 
25 to 30 percent based on the if this article is accurate since 2012 so now since 2012 in toronto and ontario we have 25 30 percent more money going to the the cops and all of a sudden they make cannabis decriminalized <laughs> boom money saved right man hours accumulated spent arresting and prosecuting and going to court and housing and criminalizing and institutionalizing users of cannabis <clears throat> when all we have to do really is decriminalize it and what do you think about that does that ever get into your way or just go okay this is what they threw down we have to go this way you're looking at me can <laughs> yeah either one of you i don't so, care so my perspective would be that i believe that you're going to see um men and women unified in solution and if, I don't know if you're with me here. I am. You're, uh, we're going to yeah. be unified in solution, but what is the solution? You have to give it time now. They're marinating in that, and they're going to come up with those together if you bring them together. Okay. <clears throat> well, we have to bring uh, them together in, in situations such as in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. where, they've, uh, where they've been doing it um, for four years now in Philadelphia. And it says marijuana has been decrimmed in, uh, uh, for a year in Philly, and it's a three-year-old article. And uh, then, you, then there's another article that says, uh, yes, it's decriminalized, but we are still collecting fines. It's been 18 months now since the city statute passed, yeah. but the state law remains. So there's your, there's your. oh, I got a joint in Philadelphia. It depends on the cop's discretion or some kind of thing. I mean, these are the, these are the issues that get in the way. This is what I sure. meant to say. Every, this plant's everywhere on the planet, but you can't access it through. Everybody's got a different weird shifting sure. sand game of laws. Like one it's of the, tough to get around. One of the good men we're meeting in Colorado is a cannabis refugee, so he has had to uproot his family more than once based on those laws in different uh, jurisdictions. Wow, he's a cannabis refugee from Canada. In <clears throat> stateside. Oh, in the states. Okay. So it's from one state to another. It's when they live in an illegal state and they want to use cannabis as a medication and then they have to move to a legal state in order to either give that medication to their children, which is one of the most common uh, cannabis refugees in the mm -hmm. States is people with children trying to treat seizure right. conditions Go to and different uh, children's and cancers countries. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And they have to move the entire family to take care of that child, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> well, just before the uh, recent fracas, uh, <laughs> Trump going to Russia and... Standing in front of the queen, <clears throat> who, quite frankly, needs to be stood in front of. Um, anyway, so here is a fella on um, the Fox TV channel network uh, saying something. I think this might end it. I think this might end the discrimination, at least in the States anyway, or at least that's the idea now. I know we hate this guy. Uh, so many people, I mean, what he's done recently, wow. But listen to this. Marijuana is removed from Schedule A, law enforcement. Law enforcement. Re oh, sorry, a little bit too fast. Hang on, I was buzzing through it at a different speed. So this is uh, this is a uh, what's his name, uh, Judge Napolitano, s talking about Trump. Really has more important things to do, and I'm talking about NYPD, cops in the street, in any any major city, and FBI. That's the last thing they should be diverting their uh, their energies to now. In the District of Columbia. Marijuana is lawful for recreational loot use. You could light up on the floor of the House of Representatives if you wanted to. So uh, <laughs> between this, uh, Alice Johnson commutation, some of the things we're hearing, are you surprised, does it feel like President Trump is revealing a libertarian sort of stance here? Or, or something that, to me, I think would appeal appeals to more millennials, it appears to more non-traditional Republicans. I, you know, I think it could ultimately be... A Good thing for the party but what do you think i mean it's amazing to see this play out i i am surprised but happily so the libertarian in me says you should be able to put into your own body what you want we're talking about adults in the privacy of their home we're not talking about people while they're driving we're not talking about giving it to children we're not talking about using it in public i mean you no more smoke marijuana on the streets theoretically than you would uh, chug a gallon of scotch on the uh, on the streets even though both are are lawful and private in uh, in certain places but for a republican to do this is somewhat startling you know the president doesn't fit a mold Okay, we'll leave it at there. The president doesn't fit a mold, but apparently Trump is, um, <clears throat> and this would be driving Jeff Sessions crazy, apparently Trump is mulling over, among other things, he's, 
he's doing. Can you imagine, though, if he just said, okay, you know what, that's enough of that. There's no federal law against it. Then it would be a state's rights thing. That's what they, That's what he always likes to talk about, a state's rights thing, whether it's for you know making wedding cakes for gay people or whatever. But a state's right thing on cannabis would be uh, most helpful, I think, don't you? Definitely it would. I mean, it would give access to it as medication for every state if that if those states so chose you know what i mean and it would eliminate the 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 chance of being arrested um for for growing it or using it as medication um having not i mean sorry um so like it, it'll eliminate cannabis refugees at the state level more or less because they're running from the state laws and but then they're still federally illegal when it comes right. to when they're That's in a, the in a wreck state right so um, they still have to worry about being raided by the federal government, yeah. um, being arrested on the federal level, going to prison on the federal level when it comes to cannabis, right? So if they eliminated the federal statutes on cannabis, then it would just be down to a state level, and then you could pick your state to live in, move or there, move to, yeah. and grow your cannabis how you see fit for yourself, and medicate how you see fit for yourself, and you would have freedom. You know what I mean at that point with your medication, which is what. I think everybody is after when it comes to getting better and treating themselves. You want freedom. You want freedom from your illness. And I think there's a resistance to that, and I think that's one of the reasons it's taking so long. There's an overall uh, institutionalized, corporatized, governmentalized resistance to doing that. I think that's the only reason. I mean, they say they don't have any information. That's, you know. I mean, well, you were talking about routine earlier, like right? And routine is the same thing when it comes to medication. Sure. For the last, you know, 100 years, we've all been focused on the pharmaceutical aspect of medication. This is what fixes you. This is what fixes you. This is what fixes you. Meanwhile, they had the reefer madness and the war on drugs that started. You know, the war on drugs was bad in the 80s and the 30s, the reefer madness and all that went on. So it just got pushed away. But if you look before that, cannabis was used as medication before that. Even in the United States, you yeah. can find bottles of medication that says cannabis sativa, 18%. And isn't it amazing? And then it'll have cocaine in there too at the same time. Yeah. It's hilarious, you know? But they, I think it was they found a, a clay pot in an Egyptian tomb that had hash residue on the inside of it. It was like 26 or 2700 years old or even older, I think. Still and, good. Uh, <laughs> probably was still good. I don't know. Uh, probably a little dry by that point, but they they found hash re residue inside of a jar. So they assumed that they had used the jar for to make some sort of like medical tincture or something like that to treat some sort of ailment back then. So yeah. it, everybody's known about it for thousands of years. Yeah. Tell me about your injury. You've got some knee problems. Yeah, I. Uh, Lots of people. So have I that. fractured a kneecap. And uh, I was misdiagnosed with a, a meniscal tear. So the meniscus is like the little cushion in between your uh, your upper and lower leg. And um, so they stuck a brace on me and uh, the brace held the fracture open instead of allowing it to close. So I just it turned on my body's um, bone grow, growing um, genes or whatever you oh, want to okay. call it. So I basically grow bone nonstop now, 24-7. So I had two surgeries in 2011 while I served in the Canadian forces and the hopes for the surgeries that I had then was to uh, correct the problem enough for me to go back and continue my career and that didn't happen I uh, failed to meet it's called universality of service okay. so that's a yearly or uh, biannual uh, physical fitness exam that you have to go through in order to stay in the military so it's a baseline test that says okay you're still good enough that if we need you to go overseas you're healthy enough that you can go over right, right. so i couldn't, couldn't do, do that it. anymore so that's why i was released so uh i left in 2012 and i moved to alberta and i ended up working in fort mcmurray for a few years up there and then um came back here so my wife could go to school she's a baker now and um so and then just the knees got worse as time went on I, the bones started growing real bad and then when i had the surgery last year in may he said that there was five or six holes in my tendon whoa so that the bone had actually grown right through the tendon itself wow and, and that's uh, gonna hurt right like that just yeah i'm at about pain. eight to nine out of ten on the pain scale i would say without cannabis daily 24 7 eight to nine out of yeah, ten. yeah and it's been that way since like 2011 well i've like had that. you in here for almost 40 minutes are you okay um, i'm surviving okay because i'm not even kidding if you need to go and do something no i'm surviving you know let me know it's yeah, not i'm uh, surviving we'll we're good impossible okay so that's that's super uncomfortable have you have you remedied anything of your own self and you, you'd have to move it to the mic mm -hmm. a bit of you have you used cannabis at all but i didn't even ask you that i i know i was waiting for you to ask me that um there it is there it is run with it yeah um 
2004, I was pregnant for my daughter, Sky, and I go into a health store in uh, Vancouver Island, and right on the cover of Mothering Magazine was this beautiful naked belly, this woman who's, you know, about to birth with a big joint in her hand, and it says that um, medical cannabis cures nausea, morning sickness. Well, I had hyperemesis. Hyperemesis is where you are, you have morning sickness, morning, noon, and night. And you're challenged to keep down water, let alone any other nutrients. So at eight months pregnant for Sky, uh, I told, you know, my partner, hurry up and go get some quick, quick. Eight and, months. Yeah, and then I was able to eat and I was able to gain weight and it, it did cure my nausea. So my experience with medical can- cannabis comes from a... Um, Practical use. Yes, and, a, <coughs> and, my, and a, from a birthing experience as well. So I birthed, I have to tell you this, Alan, so I birthed all three of my children at home in the water um, and, in the, and in the bathtub and with my first one, I did not use medical cannabis uh-huh. in my pregnancy. Um, and with the second one, I did. And the... Um, not only was the was the nausea alleviated, but the actual birthing experience of when you're dilating and you're actually pushing is uh, so much more relaxed. You're, and I was able to slow down my breathing so that you're able to not experience pain. That'll crush a lot of pain, like 30, 40% I would bet right there. Right, just by being able to relax yeah. while in the water. Yeah, so that's my experience. Wow. And so... so, so when you were pregnant, mm-hmm. would you say through your through your three pregnancies that the, the pregnancies all were as physically inconvenient? Like were they yeah. all painful, or they, and then two out of three no. were less? All my, uh, my deliveries were pain free, and those were all very special. Um, but the actual pregnancy itself, suffering from hyperemesis with all three of them, um, I was able to be alleviated in the in the in the last two where I had access to cannabis. Right. And yes. what is it again? Hyperemesis? Hyperemesis, that? yes. Mm-hmm. That's unreal. They actually it, call it cannabis hyperemesis. They have, they've been right? talking about it too, where apparently people who use too much cannabis can develop that. Right. And I, I would like to ask, <clears throat> because I'm sure people who might be alarmed <clears throat> to hear this, what, eight months oh, pregnant? Oh, oh my God, you got a fetus in there. It's like, you know, they equate it with drinking or something. Sure. So uh, did you have any at that time uh, uh, issues to get through? I mean, did your doctor say, oh, no, you can't do that? Or anybody well, tell you? No, I had a midwife and my midwives, bless them, were extremely open minded because I was at a state of so much weight loss and malnutrition oh. and vomiting water for days on end and hospitalized for dehydration that the instant relief that came within 30 minutes and I could eat and drink anything, there goes the smoothie, now I can get the stuff in and I gained weight. So I had to look at way out, the worst of two evils of having being underweight and what that would do to the baby versus being able to eat and get the nutrients in. Medical munchies. (laughs) And I did, I had had studied to the best of my ability that um, the only side effect is that the children are born with a higher IQ. So I can live with that. Did that happen? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely, yes, it did. They're born with that. a. They're born with a higher. Now, come on, not sure. the first one where you took it at eight months. Was it? Was there still? That was your first time. Your your third kid. I you, don't know you what they're taking IQ it the whole time. Is. They're all bright, but um, I do notice that the you know my two daughters were you know I I did use medical cannabis to get through that nausea. They do have a different disposition. I'm so sorry. Let me go back again. Your mm-hmm. first your first kid is. You're not taking cannabis, Correct. and then you start taking it at eight months. With my second one. With the oh, first one. Oh, so the first one, ca- never yes. any cannabis at in all. In fact, I had one. a phobia. I wouldn't be in the same room with oh, people wow. who smoked medical cannabis. Sure. If you're, I wanted it far away from me. Okay. That's uh, what I thought I had wrong. So first kid, sure. no cannabis. Second Correct. kid, you put it in there in the eighth month. Correct. And the ninth month. Correct. On through till, until till the, the kid was, was born. Per- and the third kid, from the beginning. Um, I, I tried to hold out. I was in the fourth month, and um, heaven was a twin. And so there was two of them, and I was losing weight uh, by the day. Whoa. I couldn't keep anything down, and uh, as soon as I was able to get access to two things, three really, moringa, honey, and medical cannabis, Oh yeah. then I was able to gain weight and stay out of the hospital and, and had a healthy baby. Moringa, that's good uh-huh, stuff. Yeah. I, yeah, we don't have that's green. We can use we can we can talk it's about all that. green. Green green moringa is a, is a good one, right? Yeah, I mean, I haven't used it in a while, but what's great about that again? Vitamin C. Is it's that? a superfood. Yeah, yeah. It, they they use it a lot in countries for, uh, for malnutrition. But I wanted what I wanted to say is that um, in 2004, when you know when I birthed Sky and and used medical cannabis, 
I had no awareness that there was such a thing as edibles, that I could have eaten a brownie I would have preferred. If I have known that I could have had a cup of tea, I would have. Mm. So we've come a long way even in, in my own yeah. life for me to know that you could make a coffee with it. I learned that from you. Right. Okay, well, that's true. Well, I, I remember the same thing. I mean, you know, as I look back, I mean, all the way to, to, to high school when I first tried to use it on on through, sometimes it was really... Um, a, an effect that I would call uh, sort of exciting and I'd want to listen to music or go see a movie or something. And other times I'd kind of veg out, you know, and, and then I would always think, well, she's got better pot than he does because I like the effect of this one. But it turns out it was that one was sativa and one's indica and you don't know that stuff. It's just grass. You I know, learned that weed. this year. Did you really yes, learn? Yes, I did, yeah. Oh my goodness. You don't even know what you were taking back no. when you were pregnant. No. Just whatever was available. All I knew that it was uh, organic. So because I was, oh, right. Right, I would be nursing, it was completely pesticide free and outdoor grown. Wow, that's incredible. And so have you used it for other things? Or I mean, you're not a you're not a pregnant. You don't look pregnant no, right now. No, but so. uh, I did have um, a very good man made for us uh, recently a salve uh, that you can put on your body and your face, and it's cannabis infused. Can uh, it's got coconut oil and bees no wax in it. It's a topical. It's a healing salve, and you can put that on psoriasis. You can put that on all kinds of things, and oh, you amazing. know, on your wrinkles as well. So yeah, it has many purposes. Yes. I look forward to um, some serious, and again, this this comes from the laws and legalizing it and the Trump or the whoever president or whoever finally saying, okay, enough of this nonsense, because uh, um, the burn victims, can you imagine? I mean, I've, I've seen mm. what this stuff can do to regenerate skin. I sliced this finger so badly, I've got pictures of it, you wouldn't even be able to tell. I put that in there like ozonol. Really? And, and I, I just had a gaping wound in this finger. I'll show you after the show on my phone. <clears throat> gaping wound that. stupidly opened a jar that had a broken lip and cranked it and it just went dig right and and i was gonna cl i cleaned it out sucked it out and then i was gonna put in the alcohol yeah. and all that stuff and put in the o's and all and tape it up and it just hit me use the oil instead <laughs> try that so i squirted it in the trench <laughs> put a band-aid around it didn't throb didn't cause any pain or whatever <clears throat> and when i went to bed that night um I get up in the morning and I just put another one on. Three days in a row, it's all sealed up in pink. And uh, look at that. I mean, you can't see a thing. It's unreal. So I think if they were able to spend more time, less time with the laws and how dangerous it is, and more time formulating it into, some, like you say, a salve or something for your skin, burn victims. Yes. Uh, it's amazing what it could do, even just on a sunburn. Skin cancer, too. You Skin what, cancer, you, too. You know what I like? I'm um, seeing a lot of veterans <coughs> with the with the capsules, and I see veterans where they have their little kit. They've got their morning capsules and their nighttime capsules. Oh, right. I sort of like that form of it from a convenience and a health perspective as well, that you can capsule it and be on the go, and still yeah. they can still get their medicine. They've now been able to figure out that this is a morning one, this is a daytime one, and this one will help right. you go to sleep. I kind of like that. We have, to, nice. we have to make our own capsules, though. They're not covered under the. Oh, I didn't the know stuff. that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, what, what do you do? How do you do to make capital? Uh, capital? Well, you use a. We I have a machine that processes the cannabis. Um, so it's basically like an industrial blender mixed with a slow cooker together. Uh, so you just you uh, decarboxylate your cannabis however much you need for your dosage. You throw it in, and uh, it mixes it up for you, infuses whatever fluid you're using, and off you go, man. You sounds like a commercial. Well, you got to get the name of that thing. So it sounds like Ken can make you a tincture. That oh. you can use for your your boo boos next time. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, actually, yeah. I, I had brought a a syringe with some oil in it to show you. Uh, just we, I wanted to touch on talking about the, what a nanogram is. Oh yeah, we were talking about that. We talked I about that last that. week at your house. Yeah. So I did. Now I don't know what the um, the <laughs> diffusion rate is of nanograms per milliliter of blood. Now I don't know that aspect. I don't of even it. know what that means. Okay. <laughs> so like to, to go over the legal limit, I don't know how many oh, okay. nanograms <clears throat> putting into you equals the into your actual bloodstream for the test itself. Oh, you mean so theoretically I you can could tell take you 10 how much, nanograms and only show two or something? Uh, yeah, because only so much is processed by your body, right? Ah. So um, if you take uh, FICO, like what you used for your cancer, right? Full so that's about cannabis oil. It's about 90% pure. Right, so ninety mm -hmm. percent pure THC or CBD, depending on whatever you're using. Right, mm -hmm. so at that point, you go off the dry weight. Now, I had a syringe out there that has three point five milliliters of uh, fully extracted cannabis oil in it. So at ninety percent, that's like about three, three grams total, three thousand okay. milligrams sure. of THC. We'll say. Mm -hmm. Now, a nanogram is one billionth of a gram. 
what? One billionth with a B. Yep. A billion. Yes, sir. So a the little nanogram. Yes. So the syringe that's sitting out there on a table that I can hold in the palm of my hand has three billion nanograms in it. Well, you must be hammered. <laughs> so three. So yeah. this is a completely ridiculous number. Then already on its face, it is. It can't be like really. Literally three billion is the size of my first digit of my thumb. That's three billion nanograms. So so my question is this: If you were <clears throat> if you were going to smoke a joint. Let's just keep it basic so <clears throat> even people that don't smoke joints can understand what that means. And I take one puff. How many nanograms have I got in I me? found an article about that. So the article is actually from the Denver Post, <clears throat> and I believe Figured. it was dated in 2013 or 14. And um, it states that four puffs off of a standard-sized marijuana cigarette, uh -huh. because that's what they have to call it, right? Sure. Um, Can't talk about cones. Will have in your blood 56 nanograms for one toke four puffs so divide oh, so, that by four so, one so one 16 so one puff is 16 nanograms Apparently one puff is three times the secondary over the legal limit under the new laws which what? is five nanograms will send you to prison if so, you go so over you that. need to do like an eighth of a puff in order to fall under the uh, the two grand you need nanogram to do a, limit i smoked marijuana <clears throat> but i never inhaled puff right that's what you need to so do. you could get pulled over they could suspect everything and you could read that you had you, you could you could show that you had one nanogram in you if that's even possible and then you'd still have to go through all the hassle of having been well, I think it's two to five and, and dealt then with five plus are the limits two to five and five plus yeah so yeah so, but I, I've heard it's illegal I, I gotta get the laws I mean they keep changing they keep moving things around on us but but basically two nanograms is what I heard was what we were doing in Ontario that means you're intoxicated yes <laughs> Yeah, so two you, to you, five nanograms is the initial fail, the, the, and then anything the, over five is the secondary charge. You wanted the budget to come offense. down for the police? Well, it will because there that keeps the cannabis users off the road. It's a lot less pullovers. How are you going to drive? At the beginning, I think it's going to be a real bomb because I don't think a lot of people understand the severity of the law system that's been put onto Canada. Folks are coming around now at this moment. We were already supposed to be legalized on the 1st of July. And and people are still thinking, oh yeah, well, I guess it's going to be legal soon. and That's cool, huh? And they don't realize the, the, the draconian sort of heavy laws that are behind it. And they're going to be going legally to a store to buy, you know, at the liquor store, the, the Toronto, the cannabis store of Ontario, whatever it's called. And they're going to go like they would buy a bottle of uh, booze or something. And they're going to buy this. And they could actually get pulled over on the way home. And the guy's going to want to see if they got... Ca I mean, this is going to be nuts. At the beginning, people who don't know the rules now are also not going to know the rules all that well. They'll they be, should, I had one joint at a party. That's home. okay. Yeah. It I stays was at a party. I had one so joint long, at 7 o'clock and I went home at 11.30. What's the big deal? The big deal is you're testing positive for 20 nanograms. That's what's wrong. It you stays know? in your system for so long mm. that like... If you're a medical user, so someone like myself, I've been using it daily for at least two years. Uh -huh. Okay, so it will take a certain amount of time for THC to leave my body. A month there. Now, the, the other issue with that is if you have fat on your body, THC is stored in fat cells. Now, you can say stop smoking for a week, go to the gym, and leave and after working out the fat cells will have burned off and released thc and you could test positive for thc just by burning off your own fat cells even if you haven't smoked for a week you'd be 100 percent sober and you could still end up being over by just going to the gym and burning fat cells and getting pulled over for forgetting your signal on the way out of the gym or something like that wow brought to you by sober minds everywhere folks we can't have people taking cannabis screwing everything up as a society oh my god that's unbelievable. So, yeah, you're going to really go. And then you've also done the thing where you didn't smoke it for days or you didn't take it for days just because you need to drive somewhere in the week. What is it, Tuesday? So you're, you're going to go uh, somewhere on the weekend, say. Mm. Well, if you really want to take your family to, you know, Georgia Bay or whatever it is for the weekend, I guess you better not smoke anymore between now and Saturday. Go the through weekend. your fucking pain. Deal with it. Take your kids up there. Have a good time. Come back and then decide not to drive again and start taking your medicine again. I mean, what the hell? We can't stand for this, right? But well, you can put it in drive, take your Dilaudid. 
<laughs> yeah. There's no test for Dilaudid, there's right? No there's test no test for, for morphine or oxy right? on the on <clears throat> roadside yeah. like that. There's nothing. For no, that. there's nothing like that. And they, they've been prescribed things such as this for so long, and now they want to turn. So this all keeps going into a pyramid shape. Why do they keep telling us? Okay, now it's legal, but it isn't. Now you can have it, but you can't. It's just like can it's just like alcohol, uh, except you can't smoke it outside on a patio. It's just like cigarettes, uh, except you can't smoke when you're walking down the street. Or you can't advertise. Like we're, and you can't advertise and you can't put uh, you know, girls in bikinis running around like Nothing. Budweiser can do for a beach party. I mean, not that I'm saying that that's what we're missing culturally, that every product needs to have <laughs> bikini gals running around on a beach. But you know those beer commercials, right? I mean, they're selling sex. They're, they're taking booze, and they're completely merging it with sex and going, drink this, you'll get laid and have a great time. That's what they're saying in the commercials. We can't even have a, a, a guy come on in a black background and say, I, I used to be really messed up um, with my knees from doing these uh, maneuvers and and the, unfortunately the bones grew to such a thing that I've got such pain now that I do use this cannabis and it actually factually does help eliminate my pain can't even have a commercial like that no but like a, a concert can be put on by oh sure by, by a alcohol company right yeah now most of them are why wouldn't a cannabis company not want to sponsor say a uh, Snoop Dogg concert or a Grateful Dead cover band concert or, or anything. It doesn't even that, have to be that. Exactly. But even something you know, that's could be, related could to be that Allison part of Crawl that. for all I care. You know, who cares? I mean, that's the exact point. It doesn't make sense to say this thing that we demonstrably have data on, this alcohol, and then we can't do it over here. This is what we have to change. We have to change it. I'll go out on a limb to say this, but if the Canadian government was to be producing it and they were selling their brand well then they would market it wouldn't we have commercials well i'm sure they'd be able to bend the rules in that direction <laughs> just food for thought it is food for well thought. you'd have three different commercials don't buy their cannabis the conservatives don't know how to grow it properly you know and then true enough brought to you by the liberal party you know that's and how it's going to go the other thing is though too with you political said, ads for cannabis but you say about smoking it and, and how a lot of your folks that don't want to smoke it and they want to eat it and take it in that's not even in the legislation now though no. I mean, we're still not going to have that in October. This is just dry stuff we're talking about. And they are going to take their time. Well, the, the oils will issue. be there. The, the oil, oils are going to be there. They are? The, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's oils, dried cannabis, and they're allowing concentrates they're going to be talking and about in as all, well. And in all fairness, uh, with the edibles, you know, I'm still now learning what that looks like from others as to if, if, if this is a cannabis brownie, how much of this brownie do I eat? And if I go to someone else's house and have a cannabis brownie, am I going to eat the same amount, or is there, you know, we? So I think there's, um, again, dosing along the edibles is really important. Yeah, that's again though research. Yeah. You know, that's understanding like how much of this will, you know, how much we already know that with alcohol, we know that with lots. Well, of the best things. part about cannabis is you can use trial and error because you know you're not going to die. Well, that's true too, yeah. Right? I mean, you can't do trial and error with alcohol because you get alcohol poisoning. You yeah, know what I mean? You'd be too far Or morphine point, yeah. or like, hmm, I wonder how much meth I can take. No, you can't do that because you're going to die. Right. You know? That's not going to happen with cannabis. Yeah, no. you're not going to have a very good time if you eat You'll way to too much. First. But then you're going to pass out and you're going to wake up in a day and you're going to feel great because you just slept for 18 hours. Let's talk common sense on, on our way out of here. Now, I, I want to remind folks who are, who are still listening at the end here that um, who you are and, and where we can find you, where we can keep track with the veterans. Thank you um, so much. Yeah. The Veterans but, Channel is www.veteranstelevision.com. We're a digital broadcasting channel online right now. And, and, and it's available at this moment, right? It's available. And, it, there's no cost for it. It's free for veterans all over the world. And, and do you have to be a veteran to, to view it? No, not on today's date. To we Within the channel, I think it's important to note, Alan, within the channel we have several networks that we're building now from complementary alternative medicine to um, retreats to homes and housing where um, our viewership can access other services, discounts, resources, benefits. Within that, Amazing. they log in. Yes, we encourage the veterans to log in there. We keep that private for our members. Okay, thank you very much. So that's all and uh, online available right now. It's already up and running, and this um, these series of uh, documentary shoots that you've been doing will will come up later. 
Alan, can I share one thing before we go? Sure. I think it's important for for us to know, for me to know, and to feel, you know, to stay in honor that. Ironically, and not by not by you know my it wasn't on my bucket list, but the launch of the Veterans Channel was made possible uh, this year in January by the name of a good man named Mr. John Lynch, who has uh, newly founded an entity called CanOps and is committed to bringing research and development and awareness to our veterans right now and sponsoring us in the sense of uh, going out and getting those stories right now. So I just wanted to share that and just say thank you because we're blessed to have yes. been able to launch. <coughs> and ironically, it was the, the beautiful green plant and, and everything around it and what it can do for you that did that. And what, where can we, are you guys going to be roaming across the country to keep yeah, on going all over the place? This? We're going to be posting everything uh, on Facebook and I have started uh, Instagram for the, uh, for the documentary and it is uh, Ken Proud 16 H 20 show. Okay. Yeah, so 1620 is uh, like 420, but military. Yeah, yeah but military change. time. Yeah, yeah 24 hours. Yeah, that's cool. So 1620. Yeah, we'll, every, we'll let everybody know when our first episode go, goes up. Fantastic. Yeah. When do you expect the uh, like ballpark? Uh, within the next 30 days for sure. Oh, for fantastic. The room. And I thank you for what we did at your house. We'll take those clips and, and a little bit of this and we'll, you know, we'll highlight yeah. us. Working do something with it. with it, yeah. Okay, so quick question. Well, it's not really a quick question, but I, I want a quick take on a heavy topic on, on our way out of here <clears throat> from both of you. What do they say? They say they want to protect the kids. You know, the, the gatekeepers, the government, they want to protect the kids and they want to uh, make sure that uh, the consumers are protected and that's why they're doing what they're doing and the way they're doing it and they say to get rid of the black market. The way you see legalization rolling out, is that getting rid of the black market? No, I don't think so. I think the black market's going to stay, whether it's legal and cheap for everybody, because some people aren't just going to, they're not going to want to shop at uh, an institutionalized cannabis place, like a, a store with no windows, no signs, you know, like you're walking into somewhere where it feels negative why would you want to go somewhere with negative energy yeah to get something that's such a positive thing you know you're going to want to go to a place where the people are your friends they recognize you you know there's open windows there's places to relax you know like just the places the way the way they have it right now the illegal dispensaries that are around right now are doing it the way it should be done when it comes to like customer satisfaction and that kind of stuff you know what i mean like the knowledge is there with everybody they're open they're friendly and I, you just don't I don't think that everybody's going to want to have to go to this place to get it. Right. You know? I would say that there is a certain demographics of men and women that are not um, going to want to be red flagged crossing the border if that potential does exist. And I've talked to a few of them who are not quite comfortable going and getting a prescription and, and having that being a, a patient per se until they are sure that it does not affect them uh, with international travel. Well, I think we're all a little bit nervous about that. Uh, international travel right now is, uh, <laughs> there's a problem going on almost everywhere. Well, and, I'll uh, find out Friday. Yeah, I guess you will. Because we, we just had a clip on the show, you might hear no, it later. about. Uh, uh, well, you won't. But, he won't but, but I'm saying people that have been um, you know asked to cross the border, you do know that some people have been asked whether they uh, use it or not. And then this one gentleman who apparently doesn't use it, or maybe does, I don't know, but he, he wasn't stopped for that. He was stopped because he invests in, in an American legal, in, in a state where there's a legal company, you know, like your company or my company. He's investing into when they found that out, they wouldn't let him into uh, the border. So that's why I think, yeah, this Trump, whatever else he does, I hope he manages to get this cannabis thing, throw that lever, you know. Um, I hope we can get this done soon. But I really uh, appreciate you guys coming in and putting in the hard work that you put in, the traveling, and that you were able to find a benefactor to, to help uh, get you through this. We have to stop some things and we have to change some things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure glad that you guys are we're on the same team. Uh, thank you for coming in. Thank uh, you. This Thanks has been Green us. Crush Conspiracy Queries. It's another one for the can. We're we're sitting here looking at episode. What is this? Episode 120. Green Crush. 48 and um it's gonna be a bit of a long ride getting through the summer with the heat i guess but uh 
Pay attention to your local politician. We have a new leader here in Ontario, and he is uh, says he's open to feedback. And he wanted to change the ridiculous system that was provided in the past, uh, set up to go by Kathleen Wynne, and then uh, they're pretty much going to go with it as it is somehow. I don't know why that is, but I have my suspicions. They aren't really the people running things. If you believe Doug... Just a rotten nightmare. All right, this is Alan Park, Green Crush.